Aftershock Comics has the best batting average of any comic publishing company to date. It's yet to even have a mediocre book. With how many top names they get, the regularity of the issue output, and quality all around, it's no wonder why they're the tippy top of the tier on this. And honestly, originally this video was supposed to be a what's my favorite one, but I can't choose my favorite from their catalog. So instead, I'm going to ramble on a bit about how awesome all the releases from Aftershock Comics are right now. Please note, I am reading this list off of their website, so it's in alphabetical order, so none of these are, you know, best to worst. But if you've been following this channel or my Comic Sense channel, you may know which ones I like the best. So right off the bat, I want to say that if you are curious about Aftershock Comics, Aftershock Genesis is just a previews book that while it does get your mouth salivating at all the goodies it shows, it doesn't have a full story to it. So if you want to see what that looks like, everything's linked in the description below. Just go to Aftershock Comics. Then we start the list off proper with Alters, which actually has a surprising plot about a transgendered hero who gains superpowers, which surprised the hell out of me. I'll admit that I'm always a bit turned off when a book tries to be socially relevant, because in recent times, at least in my experience, there's been a lot of soapbox and 2x4 writing. Soapbox writing being when someone just wants to rant and rave about their views with a thin veil of a story on it, so the message is actually hindered by the quality of the book. Whereas 2x4 writing is basically the same thing, though it's more like someone wrapping their script or story around a 2x4 and just hitting you in the head with it to beat the point home. But neither of these terms describe this book. It's actually a fantastic read. Basically, it's mutants start appearing and the fallout from that, being driven by a personal story that is relatable in wanting to feel comfortable in your own skin. I mean, Paul Jenkin is an Eisner Award winner, and you can definitely see why in this book. Plus, Leila Lee's on art gives it a fresh look, and I've already spoken so highly of Tamara Bonvillain on colors, so that just bumps it all the way up. I know several friends, particularly a couple transgendered friends, because of their connection, really think this is one of the best books out now. And even if I don't think it's the best book out now, it is definitely a book for everyone regardless. Then there's American Monster. When it comes to Brian Azzarello, he either knocks it out of the park or strikes out without a reel in between. He works best within the grid of humanity, which is why 100 Bullets is one of my top 10 comics of all time. Eventually, I'll make an official list. American Monster is in that ballpark, and Azzarello gets the home run on it. While the story itself isn't the most complex, it's within the writing that makes the character something you want to follow throughout this crime drama. I actually do hesitate to call it a crime drama, as the way I've described it to others is is walking tall without the altruism, a horribly dated reference. There's also a real animated feel to the artwork by Juan Doe, almost a Bruce Tim style with a very neon noir color scheme that just really gives it a great 90s neo-noir feel. I doubt most listeners will understand this reference, but it feels like it's lit like the series Forever Night. It's a superb read if you enjoy that genre, and it is Brian Azzarello's forte. The next two are Animosity and Black Eyed Kids, two comics that I've gone at length to talk about. So rather than bog this down to be even longer, so rather than bog this down with even more fanboying over these two phenomenal comics, I'll just annotate my first issues on Animosity and Black Eyed Kids, as well as the mediocrely fun comic sins for both of them. Short answer, they are quintessential reads that everyone should own, and I'd still give my left hand for a signed copy of either. And hey, Christmas is coming. I realize I added the tonguey emoji in my script. I have issues. Next is Blood Blister, which doesn't release until January, so I can only comment that Phil Hester is a hoot to read. I particularly loved his run on Green Arrow, as well as the Eisner Award-nominated The Wretch comic. Hey, wait a minute. I know the history of the character The Wretch. He appeared as the creep in Negative Burn, a Joe Pruitt joint. I see what you did there. But honestly, he is a pretty great writer with a relatively broad range. As for Tony Harris on art, he's a phenomenal artist when it comes to realism while sticking in a comic style, if that makes any sense. If you have no idea who he is, then you've yet to read one of the best DC books ever with Starman or the quintessential must-own Ex Machina by Brian K. Vaughn. Eric Layton and Guy Majors are on inks and colors respectively. While I'm not familiar with Layton, Guy Major has been a fantastic colorist in his own right, so I'm excited and you should be too! Then we have Captain Kidd. 
a reverse Shazam story of a middle-aged man who has a hell of a life being able to transform into a teen superhero. This is actually a really neat read, and I think that's in large part to Mark Waid and Tom Payer's age. Both are fantastic writers in their own right, so teaming up and having a character around their own age bracket, being able to rediscover his youth in a big way, comes off as a bit self-fulfillment writing, but in doing that, we get a surprisingly fresh take because the main character is older than the average comic book main character, and he shows his age. It's not an I'm too old for this standard writing. There's a cynical yet playful nature that just works. It's hard to explain, but read it, it is worth it. Wilfredo Torres is on art for this, and as you can see, it's a solid art style that allows for a very almost Silver Age feel to the art, and Kelly Fitzpatrick on colors just enhances that feel. I don't want to say that it's a love letter to the Silver Age, but at the same time, it almost feels like sitting at a bar with someone going, well, back in my day, comics were dot dot dot. Granted, it could be some of the references within it, like the Jack Kirby machine, that gives me that feel, but again, it's kind of awesome in its tone and everything. Ooh, Dreaming Eagle is next. I honestly feel really bad that I don't praise this comic as much as it really deserves. It recounts the tales of the first black Americans in the United States Air Force in Tuskegee, Alabama, while pairing it expertly with the civil rights movement. Garth Ennis frames very real events and a topic that is extremely huge today without making it a simple answer kind of story. Using war proper as the counterpoint to the U.S. civil rights movement just works surprisingly well, especially when you see the generational tension between father and son that really is the heart of this. Enos's fantastic writing is paired with Simon Colby on art and John Callis on colors, making this book feel really truly like one of those old war comics of yesteryear. Even when it's doing just character-oriented talking stuff, it has a phenomenal throwback feel while still being unique and relevant even today, especially today. Ah, uh, insects. Nothing says wholesome family entertainment like Victorian-era feminist erotica. Before I get to Marguerite Bennett's writing, look at this art! The only other thing I've seen from Ariella Constantina is Deep State from Boom Studios, and there, like here, is damn good. It stays on model but has the rough line work that anyone who's followed this channel knows that I am a huge fan of this style above all others. And then when you pair that with the painted colors by Jessica Colleen and Brian Van Zella just adds so much. It gives the lines an almost sensual flair that heightens not only the sexy time, but the beauty of the entire thing. Now we can get into Margaret Bennett's writing. What is there to really say about her writing that I haven't said before in most of my reviews of her work? She's a masterwork writer when it comes to being playful while juxtaposing it with character. And even when she's going into visceral gore, shines through, yet how she handles that, it never feels out of place when serious moments happen. That's why she's currently one of the, if not the, best writer of the last five years. Next up is Jackpot, a righteous romp of a comic that I've covered on first issues and I've been following it ever since. To be fair, I have been following most of the Aftershock comics. Anyways, the first issues for that is going to be annotated somewhere on screen because this is going to be a long as hell video. Sorry. I really have nothing to say about Lifespanners, mainly because it may be in production hell for the rest of forever. It either comes out maybe in 2017, or is cancelled depending on what sources I look at. But it's by Tim Seeley, who wrote the epic hack slash revival, and my personal favorite DC comic book of the last couple years, Grayson and a plot revolving around a clickbait writer faux journalist actually having a real story on a conspiracy involving superpowers just makes me wish I knew more. Hell, I would love to just see the script for that thing. Then we come to Replica, a story about an intergalactic detective who decides to go the Michael Keaton route of his life and get cloned, but hijinks ensues. Paul Jenkins is a writer I know I mentioned earlier, but I think everyone knows who he is, but no one really knows his name. I mean, he has a ton of highly rated comics under his belt, like his run on Hellblazer, Incredible Hulk, or The Darkness. And this actually starts fairly just like how a good sci-fi detective story should, and then grows into being, have I used the frame beautifully bombastic yet? Because that's a good way to describe this. The bombast in the writing and the art really capitalize on the unique setting. Andy Clark has a keen eye for detail that really bolsters the futuristic world and aliens while not being off model when he draws humans 
which is something surprisingly harder than expected in me reading so many sci-fi comics lately. And while the colorist changes from issue 1 to 2, there's not a big difference between the two, so the realism of the colors really shines through, whether it's Marcelo Mialo or Dan Brown. By the way, I do want to say, if I mispronounce your name, I am so sorry. Slowly, I'm running out of ways to say how amazing all these comics are. Luckily for the next two, I have first issues on it. The Revisionist and Rough Riders. They're awesome, and no wonder when you see the teams behind them. Watch my reviews of them, and you'll see what I mean. I am looking forward to Rough Rider 2 that should be coming out sometime next year, soon, I'm hoping. How do I describe Second Sight and do it justice? The main character can see through the eyes of serial killers, and it leads to problems. But now, as his daughter pisses off some of the upper crust of London, he needs to dive back into that to protect her. The best way I've come about describing this book is that it feels very much like an indie British book from the late 80s, early 90s. There's an unblinking darkness to the book, spinning from the less than stellar life of Ray, the main character, to the point that the big bads in this are a bunch of child abusers. However, it's not overly grim dark, but rather, it does it in a way you wouldn't really expect, as it does have a heart and soul that doesn't quite shine through, but you can definitely see it through the smudges. As for the art, that's probably what makes me feel it's hearkening back to the British invasion of the US indie scene. It's got the heavy inks and the deep colors of the time that really makes it oddly fresh in recent times. Shipwreck is written by Warren Ellis. I think that may be the best way to describe it. Warren Ellis is my favorite writer of all time ever, so you can see me maybe being a bit biased towards it, but hey, if you've read any of Ellis's work, you'd understand what I mean. And this is expertly handled in a surrealist way. The story follows Dr. Shipwright, yeah, pseudo pun name is Punny, as he survives a strange shipwreck while he pursues the saboteur, and we see who Shipwreck is as a person while utilizing a dreamlike, almost disjointed feel to give it a great mystery vibe that doesn't give you a clear answer of what's actually going on, but does pay off later. Honestly, the best part of this that really elevates the writing is Phil Hester's art. The angular yet intentional line work keeps it realistic in scope, but never enough that the strange nature ever feels betrayed by the art, and Mark Englert's dark coloring really complements that well. Even in the first issue, you'll just crave more with the layers and representation. Unlike everything else on this list, I actually missed out on Strayer until I started this list, and boy do I feel bad for only just discovering this book. Strayer is the titular character, and he's a monster hunter, but he does what he does not for any good moral reason, but because he wants to get paid. Then again, he's good at his job, and as the old idiom goes, if you're good at something, never do it for free. Why do you think I don't get paid for doing this? But of course, there's a big quest that he gets roped into. I know what you're thinking. But Archivist, there's a billion, million, trillion monster hunting books out there. What makes this one so special? Well, what's so special is that Justin Jordan handles these characters adeptly to making them intriguing and interesting that you want to follow them on their adventures and see how they interact with the world, which is a big crux for how this lays out. Hell, you could actually make an argument that this is just a more action-based Shadows of the Colossus clone, and you wouldn't be wrong, but the world we see, the characters interacting within it, and the fast-paced action just work out to make this a great read overall. And then there's the art from Juan Gideon, which is great on talking scenes, but becomes phenomenal when it hits the action, with an odd amount of details but not details in it that makes the action flow quickly, but getting you hooked into feeling the scope of the fight, both in motion and in scale. And of course, Tamara Bonvillain's colors are the toppest of tops. Luckily, there is actually more than one issue now that I found out about this series, because it got me hooked. And finally, Super Zero. It's an Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti book. If you know what that means, well then, you know you're going to get a well-written, quirky sort of read with odd comedy yet a huge heart behind it. And Super Zero allows them to really play with the superhero genre and even comic culture as a whole. The story follows the mundane life of Drusilla Dragowski and her dreams of having a superhero identity. Seriously, this book is awesome because of how much it really does show how much fun Connor and Palmiotti have while writing, yet never to an absurd, sloppy level. There's a couple different layers of enjoyment, be it in how Raphael de la Torre handles the artwork spectacularly to give it a surprising realism alongside Marcelo Mialo's colors just to make a real world feel like the real world. Seriously, look at this art! It's, it's awesome! This whole book is just wicked cool! Yeah, apparently I still use wicked as a positive term. Neat.
And that's the whole of the Aftershock Comics catalog of awesome. And frankly, it was founded in April 2015, but with the diverse lineup they have, it feels like they've been around for so much longer. All of these books have merit on their own, and while some may not be up your alley, like maybe you aren't a fan of the premise of animosity, or the art for the revisionist doesn't grab you. Each title warrants a read to find out. They're the best in their respective genres, so there's a good chance it'll convert you. Only one way to find out. So check with your local comic store to see if they've been stocking this powerhouse company. If not, tell them they should. And if they do, buy them. Or if you're a digital kind of person like I kind of have to be, they are all available on Comixology. I hope this has been an enlightening look at a relatively young company that has been knocking it out of the park. If you agree or disagree with me, leave a comment below. I'm always up for discussion. As always, go like The Archivist on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, check out my two other channels, A Comic A Day and Comic Sins, and as always, stay golden, Inklings.